Psalm 84. How amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts. My soul longer, yea, even fainter, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Yea, the sparrow hath found an house, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young, even thine altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are they that dwell in thy house, they will be still praising thee. Then you get that word that's often left out, and I think it's time somebody explained it. I've never heard it explained, and I always explain it. It's the word selah. Now that's a word, it's a musical term. The Psalms are not only intended to be read, they're intended to be sung. And selah literally means stop singing and think what you've just sung before you go on to sing the next bit. Because the next bit is a different theme. So when you get a sila, it's pause and think. And I think we need a lot of pauses and thinks in our ordinary hymns because we just race through them as if we're paid peace rate, you know. And it's good. So what, when you get this sila, it isn't necessary to read it. What it just means, it's a musical term which means stop singing, think what you've been singing about because we're going on to another theme. So here he's talking about the house, the temple, the living God. Sila. Then it comes to the next thing. Blessed is the man whose strength is in thee, in whose heart are the ways of them, who, passing through the valley of Barca, makes it a well. The rain also fills the pools. They go from strength to strength. Every one of them appeareth in Zion before God. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Then again, change. Behold, O God, our shield, and look upon the face of thine anointed. For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man that trusteth in thee. So ends the reading from the word of God, and may he add his blessing to it. Now the Psalms are Psalms. And with every Psalm, you've generally got a background to it. And it's not always easy to locate the time and place when a certain Psalm was sung. Some of you can. Psalm 32 Psalm 51 relate to David's great tragedy over Bathsheba. And other psalms like 90 and 91 were the songs of Moses. Psalm 119 was the one that was used at the time when the moving out of the captivity and thinking of the construction of the temple. Others are not so readily identified except a group that deal when David was on the run. Psalm 34 when he hid in the cave of Adullam and everybody that was in distress disillusioned, discouraged and in debt they all came to him and what a wonderful time he must have had and at that time with all the moaners and the groaners and the whiners and the complainers he sang I will bless the Lord at all times he needed to now this psalm is in that area it's when David is on the run and if you recall anything of his history it's very briefly this. You know, God never intended Israel to have a king until David. David was God's choice for a king. And they have to wait till David was born. And that's sometimes when you wonder, why doesn't God do something? God is waiting. Because there's a certain man coming up at a certain time for which God has got certain purposes. And he will not move till that man's on the scene. And that's why God himself had to wait 30 years while Jesus was growing up on earth. And during those 30 years while Jesus was growing, nothing really happened. Everything happened almost in the last three weeks of his life. But as far as that was concerned, to get three weeks, there had to be 30 years. So it's like this. And sometimes it appears that God's doing nothing when God is waiting for men to grow up. And David was selected as a king when he was just a boy. 
and he couldn't be king when he was a boy. Besides, Israel had pushed God and said, we want a king. And in order to teach them a lesson, God gave them a king. And he gave them a man called Saul. And God picked the best man that was available. There's no question about Saul being the greatest man in Israel at that time. He was the best swordsman. He was a natural leader, man of great talent and ability. A man who started out being deeply humble and conscious of the great thing that was thrust upon him. Then came his downfall. He became too big for himself. When he was little in his own eyes, God used him. Then he became too important in his own eyes and God put him down. And I hope we get the lesson from that before we get anything else. The moment you think you've really arrived, that's the day you're in trouble. The moment you feel you can't be done without, that's the first day you can be done without. The time you feel that you can always be done without, that's the time you can never be done without. And God will always exalt the humble and he will always cut the proud down to size. So he did this with Saul. Now when Saul knew that David was to be the next king, that wasn't so bad. Because he thought, well, uh, somebody's got to follow me so he'll see my time out. But then he found that David was making rapid strides and the incident over Goliath, when everybody was scared stiff to fight him, including Saul, and David goes out, then the trouble starts. And David then becomes the subject of Saul's envy and jealousy and hatred and he really gets him on the run and one day Jonathan comes to him and says you know my dad much as I like him I don't know whether I ought to be faithful to him or to you but you know he's got it laid up now you better watch it he's going to ask you to come to a party and he's got plans to see you off I don't know whether you want to take the risk so David says well I'll risk it at least I'll give him one chance so he goes out to have dinner and that night they're having dinner. And you know what happens while he's having dinner? Saul attempts to kill him. So David ran. And he had to hide in dens and caves in the wilderness. He was really on the run. Now while he's on the run, he begins to think. And like many a fellow that's away from home at Thanksgiving, he begins to think of home. And he begins to think of everything associated with home. And he begins to think of the old church back home and the people back home. Everything they'll be doing on the day. And he's imagining it and going through it. And if you've never been in another country at a time like that, then you don't know it. But if you have, you appreciate it. I remember one time being in the south of France, right down by the Spanish border. And uh, it was a Sunday. I was all by myself and there was nothing on till the evening. So I decided to take a walk down by the Mediterranean. I was staying there and it was a very nice place, very hot. So I went down Sunday morning and... Central European time at that time was one hour behind the British time. So I got myself all organized for 11 o'clock London time. And I sat there and began to think, now what will they be doing now? They'll be singing the opening hymn. So I sang a hymn all to myself. Then I said they'll have the invocation, so I prayed. And they'll repeat the Lord's Prayer, so I repeated the Lord's Prayer. I thought, second hymn coming up, so I chose a second hymn. Then they'll read the scripture, so I read a portion to myself. Then they'll give out the announcement. So I began to pray for all that was going on all week. Then they'll take up the offering. So I took it out of one pocket and put it in the other. And then I thought, now we'll have another hit. So we had another hit. Then I thought, the choir will sing. I wonder what they're singing this morning. So I trollowed a few bits. I thought, the choir will sing. Now I thought, we'll have the message. And there was nobody to preach to, so I preached the evening message to myself. And I went right through with it. Now, by the time I'd finished the whole service and pronounced the benediction over myself, I really felt I'd been with them a bit. I was a long way from them, all on my own. But I was with them in spirit, in a very real sense. This is David in the south. He's away from them, but he's with them in heart. And his first thought is the house of God. And that's why he gives this lovely word. How amiable are thy tabernacles, or how lovely are thy dwellings. How lovely. And you know, there's something about a building, and, and we're not worshipping bricks and mortar, because that's not what the church is. But it is where the church meets. And there's something about the church to which you belong, there's something about the building in which you found the Lord that becomes precious to you. You can't avoid it. It's the place you met the Lord. I go home periodically about every 15 months, and the chances are I'll go back to one of the churches that I've known. And if I get a chance, I'll go back to the church where I was converted. And I'll walk to the seat 
where God laid hold of me. And I'll do what I customarily do. I'll get down in that seat and thank God for everything he's done and rededicate my life as it were again from that seat where I first found the Lord. It's a bit sentimental, but then most of us are sentimental inside. And there's nothing wrong with that as long as it reacts on a proper level. And so David is saying, how lovely are thy dwelling. Lord, I'm sitting back thinking, and my soul longs, yea, it even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out to the living God. He's not talking about the preacher who they got this morning. He's not talking about the choir. I wonder what that crowd singing today. They sang that three weeks ago. He's longing for to be in the sanctuary. He's longing to be with the people of God. He's longing to be there and join in the singing and the praise. And the house of God becomes a real thing. But more than anything, it's God he wants. The living God. His heart and his flesh is crying out. You ever felt that desire? Can you honestly say my soul longs, my heart and my flesh cries out for the living God? I give everything I've got to be in the house of God with the people of God. I never, never forget in World War II getting a letter from one of our young fellows and he'd had a pretty easy time in the war till D-Day. And boy, he really caught it after that. So did his group. And I remember the letter he wrote to me. He said, I'm writing this to you. It could easily be the last letter I ever write. And he gave me certain instructions to tell his wife if he didn't come back, etc. But he says, I'm writing to you from the banks of what is ultimately the Rhine, but I'm really writing under the bridge at Nijmegen. And if you know anything about Arnhem and Nijmegen, you know what it was like. But he said, I'm sitting here thinking of you back home. It's Sunday morning. And I remember this. I would give everything I possess to be back in the church on Sunday morning. I never realized how precious it is. But he says, I can't be in church. But he says, my whole soul just longs to be with you. Will you pray for me that if God brings me through, this is the way I'll feel when I get back. You ever felt that way? My heart, my flesh cries out for the living God. And he begins to think about the old building and the place where he sat. He says, you know, it's an amazing thing. The sparrows found a place for itself. We don't have churches today where the sparrows make nests. But you come over to Britain, we can show you a few. They build their nests in the, in the sanctuary. You sometimes get the birds, the swallows fly in, and boy, you've got an awful job getting them out. We've even had a few creepy and crawlies in here. And it's been quite an exciting time. We've had a bird get stuck up here once or twice, and... Uh, it's an interesting occupation, especially when the poor fellow's trying to preach and everybody's watching the bird. <laughs> and David says, I can well remember those occasions when the swallows have got flying around there and the birds have made a nest. You know, even the birds have a longing place for that. Oh God, I wished I was there. I wished I was there. Oh Lord, listen to his title. Oh Lord of hosts, my King, my God. This is the King that's talking. But the king says, I've got a king, and my king is the king of kings, and I long for him. And my king is my God, and he is the Lord of hosts. I'll touch on the Lord of hosts later, so I won't comment now. Then he thinks about the people who he really says are fortunate people. Blessed are they that dwell in my house. They will be still praising me. I wonder how deeply you love the house of God. How deeply do you love it? Is it the greatest concern of your life? Do you always go to the Lord's house when you can? Are you good at your regular attendance on the Lord's day? Or are you one of those that just go in fits and starts? More fits and less starts, you know. Or are you always there? Can you be counted on? Can you be reckoned that you're always there on time in your place? That's where you be. You just love the house of God. You love God's house. You love the sanctuary. It's the place you'd rather be than any other. I hope you do. Because there may come a day when you can't go to the house of God. I can only remember in my life one Sunday, uh, stands out clearly, when I couldn't go to the house of the Lord and I was feeling well. I'd been uh, up for about six weeks once, about 12 years ago, when I couldn't go at all. But other than that, I've been, but this particular Sunday, for some crazy reason, 
I lost my voice. That's a terrible thing to happen to a preacher. I lost my voice. So I couldn't do anything other than just sit at home. And I sat at home. I put on the radio. And we don't have the gospel radio you have here. Then I tried the television and we had him singing. And I left the television on to see the program and I scrapped that after about 20 minutes. You know, I sat at home and I can't honestly remember putting in a, a funnier Sunday, a, a more, less Sunday-like Sunday than ever you could dream of. And you know, it was the longest week I ever put in because it was two weeks. Because I hadn't been to church on Sunday. And it seemed such a loss. I hope you treasure going to the house of God. There'll come a day when you can't go. And then you'd give everything you've got to go. Make sure that when that day comes, you've got no regrets. That you can look back and say, every day I could be there, I was there. Every service I could attend, I was there. And the result is that what I've got left now, I can't be there, but my memories are sweet and I haven't got any regrets. This is what David's saying. I'm so glad that when I had the chance, I was there. And I'd give anything I've got to be there. Then he focuses attention from the church to the person who's there. Now let's look at this man. Just the man. Any man. And the man whose strength is in the Lord, in whose heart are the Lord's ways. Now, is this your heart and mine? Is your strength in the Lord or in your right arm? Is your strength in the Lord or is it in your investment? Is your strength in the Lord or is it in yourself? Is your strength in the Lord or is it in the support of other people? Let me tell you, other people may not let you down, but they are capable of it. God is incapable of letting anybody down. And where you need strength and I need strength is from the Lord. And he's the only one that guaranteed it to me. I don't know that I'm going to get strength from anybody, anywhere. I've no resources in myself, and I don't find anyone to whom I can go and get strength. I might get advice, I might get encouragement, I might get criticism, but I can't get strength from anybody, except God. Do you know what he guaranteed to me and you? This, as thy days, so will thy strength be. Two ways of looking at it. One is that if I live to be 155, then as long as my days are, so my strength will last. If I live to be 35, which I've just passed, then my strength will come to me. But you know, it doesn't mean that. It isn't just as thy days. It does mean as long as they go on, I'll be strengthened. But that's not the meaning. All the power of the verse is in that word as. As thy days. And there are some days you're going to need much more strength than you do other days. And you never know what you need before the day starts. Do we not say we never know what a day is going to bring forth? You get it one morning and you say, everything's going my way. Couldn't be better. It's a great day to be alive. And I hope you get a few days like that. They help. And then there's another day you start and you say, you know, the only mistake mistake I made today was getting out of bed. I should have stayed here. From the moment I got up, I should have known when I hit my toe on the bedpost, it was going to be one of those days. I should have known when I spilt the coffee down my shirt, it was going to be one of those days. I should have known when I got a flat tire that this wasn't my day. And when the jolly elevator got stuck and I got stuck in it, you know, I should have quit then. But I just went on to the bitter end. Oh, brother... What a day, what a day, what a day. And you know, everybody gets those. But the important thing is this, I've only found one day, one way to beat that. And that is, I don't even wait now. I always used to get up and pray. But I don't even take any chance. I really don't. And God knows this is true. The moment I open my eye, I get praying before I get out of bed. And then I pray after I've got out. But I mean, I don't take any chances between getting out case I'd break my neck on the floor, you know. And this is what I pray because I don't know any other way to pray. When I wake, I say, Father, it's a new day. And I don't know what's ahead of me. This is the prayer I prayed this morning as soon as I opened my eyes. I don't know what's ahead of me today because I know the program of the day. But I don't know what's ahead of me. But you do. And you see, God is the only one that knows what's ahead of you in those 24 hours. He knows everything. 
Now, Father, I don't know what's ahead of me, but you do. So here and now, before I start, I'm claiming by faith all the grace I need and all the strength I need to get through this day. And I'm not bothered about tomorrow. It might never come. It's today. Do you know what I've discovered? As thy days. And the some days I need more strength and the some days I need less strength. But whatever I need, it's promised to me and my strength is in the Lord. Is that where your strength is? In the Lord. I find that no matter how weak I am, he is weak. In fact, the weaker I am, the stronger his strength. In fact, the more weak I am, the better his strength. In fact, when I am weak, then am I strong. In fact, his strength is made perfect in my weakness, whose strength is in the Lord. Is that where you get your strength from? Strength means to be strong. God needs strong people. Boy, you've got to be strong today. If you're not strong in the strength which God supplies, you'll never stand up to it. But if you're strong in the strength which God gives, then you can face anything. So he says, blessed is the man whose strength is in thee, in whose heart are God's ways. Is God's way your way? We used to sing a spiritual song, I think that's what the scripture would call it, um, which goes, God's way is the best way. I've never found that God's way is the easiest way. In fact, nine times out of ten, it's the toughest. But I found it's the best. It's the best way. And when a man's heart is set on God's way, whatever ways are open to me, it's God's way that's going to settle my choice. I can go my own way. I can go the way of least resistance. I can go the way, the popular way, which everybody else is going. I can go the way which my friends advise me to go, or I may go God's way. And just for the record, supposing that God's way is different from all those other ways, then is it settled in your heart that once you know God's way, once you know it, that's for me. That's the way I go. Well, you know you're a fool. Well, if you're a fool, you're in good company. Because nearly everybody that's been named a fool in Scripture has generally been going the right way. They call my Lord a fool. They call him mad. They call the Apostle Paul mad. They call Peter mad. They called Rhoda mad when she said God answered prayer. So you're in good company. I'd sooner be in that mad crowd than some other mad crowds I know of. And when you say, well, I don't know where he's leading, but I don't have to know where he's leading. I hope you've learned that. We don't have to know where God is leading. All we have to do is go where he's leading. He knows where he's leading. Isn't that a lovely hymn that's sung? I, I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I know who holds tomorrow. And the one who holds tomorrow is the one who holds my hand. So God's way is the best way. And even if I don't always know where it's going to lead me to, ultimately it's the best way to travel because he knows. And his way is the best way. Oh, says David, happy is the man whose strength is in thee, in whose heart are God's ways. Now look what this man does. When he passes through the valley of Barca, he makes it a well, and the rain also fills the pool. Now this word Barca means weeping. Who, when he goes through the valley of weeping, he turns it into a place of refreshing. You know, you've got to be walking with God to do that. You've got to be walking through God to turn the bitterest experiences of life into something that's sweet. But when you have the bitter experiences, do they embitter you or do they sweeten you? Do they draw you nearer to Him or take you further away? Do you turn them from a place of weeping into a place of supply? The valley of weeping into a fountain of water. This is the translating of the tough experiences in life. We heard from Bob Craning of the toughest experience I think ever a man had, which was Job. Job's lying there from head to foot. And the only comfort he can get from anybody is, why don't you admit that you've been a sinner? Why don't you admit you've done what you shouldn't do? I mean, God must be punishing you, man. Why don't you use your brains? Can't you get the message? You're in the state you are. It's no use claiming to be innocent. God wouldn't allow an innocent man to suffer like this. 
And most of us argue as stupid as that. And out of his sorrow, out of his pain, out of his suffering. Do you know he gave something to you and me that's been the greatest blessing. He gave us this verse which has been used more than any other at a funeral as far as I can remember. The Lord gave. The Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He gave me this one too. Though worms destroy my body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. It was Job that said it, not Handel in the Messiah. Handel's Messiah got in a long time after Job said it. Job was the man who said, I know that my Redeemer liveth. And if you've seen the state he was in. Now that's what it means to turn your sorrow into a fountain of blessing to other people. And have you not discovered that sometimes God permits you to go through deep sorrow in order that you'll be a blessing to other people later on? That's the way he does it in scripture. See, there's a Hosea. Man I'd love to speak about sometime. Hosea was a man who was going to give a message to the people on their backsliding. And God often uses a term for backsliding. He calls it spiritual adultery. Everybody knows what adultery is. Everybody knows what being unfaithful to a wife or unfaithful to a husband. We know what it means. So God takes these terms and says, this is what's happened to Israel. She's been unfaithful. She's been an adulteress. She's played the harlot. And Hosea might have said, yeah, yeah, well, we all know that, Lord, it happens and it'll go on at the end of the day, de da de da And God really hits him with it. And you know, Hosea goes through the most shattering experience he's ever had in his life. Because he married a beautiful young girl. She was a lovely girl. If you read the way he describes that wife of his, she was a beauty. And he was so happy with her. And then for no reason, seemingly, she suddenly goes off the rails altogether. And she starts dating somebody else. And you know, she doesn't stop with one. She finds she's attractive to them. And she's attracted by them. So she dispenses her favors quite freely. And the result is that she gets known as so many people do. And of course, the more they get known, the less important they become. And finally, she finds that now she's buying and selling. So she's giving herself. And she becomes just a harlot. Sells herself to any bidder. Finally, she gets to such a stage that nobody wants her, even at that price. So she's being sold in the marketplace as worthless chattel. Imagine your wife getting down to that stage. And somebody tells Hosea that his wife's on sale in the marketplace. She's probably riddled with disease. That's just a chance. But she's shattered as a woman. She's lived with more men than ever she'll be able to count. And here's Hosea. And he goes down into the marketplace and says, how much? And he buys her back again. And he doesn't just let her die. He takes her back and makes her his wife again. And loves her as he's always loved her. It's a wonderful story of pathos and tenderness. And you know, Hosea must have had the heart. I don't know. There's not many men got a heart like Hosea. And he had that kind of heart. And when he'd been through all that and suffered, now God says, Hosea... Do you know what I'm talking about now? If ever a man under heaven knew what he was talking about, he did. Now he says, Hosea, go and tell them. And out of the deep sorrows, the valley of weeping, Hosea becomes a fountain of life. Have you ever read the 14th chapter of Hosea? It's the greatest chapter in the Bible on backsliding. And do you know what Hosea is saying and God saying through him? I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely. And that's what he'd done with his wife. And very often God allows men and women to go through deep sorrow that they may be a blessing to others. So when you pass through your valley of weeping, try to remember God's going to turn those tears into a fountain of blessing for somebody else. And they go on from strength to strength. And every one of them, appears before God in Zion. That's our greatest hope. That one of these days, we shall see him face to face. O oh Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O oh God of Jacob. Two descriptions of God. In the greatest sense, and in the Christian life, I hope you know this, you need two instruments. You need a telescope and a microscope. Telescope to see how big he is, 
and a microscope to see how personal he is. And here you have the telescope, the Lord of hosts, King of kings and Lord of lords, eternal ruler of the changeless round, the one who's got the whole world in his hand. You cannot paint him too big, the Lord of hosts. And then you bring him right down to our level, the God of Jacob. And you know if he was the God of Jacob, he'd be the God of anybody. Jacob was about the biggest scoundrel that ever walked on two feet. And you know, when you think of the way God looked after Jacob, and boy, Jacob needed some looking after. He was the first bargain transactor with God. That's how the tithe came into being, by the way. And he deceived his father. His mother was no better. She told him to put the skins on, which he did. Then he went before his dad, and his dad says, You sniff like Esau, but you talk like Isaac. Who are you? And he turns around and says, I'm Esau, and collects the birthright and the cash. Then he has to run for his life, because Esau's going to kill him. And that night he sleeps rough. He's out in the open. He's got a stone for a pillow. That's a happy way to spend the night. And he, just there under the stars, he wakes up. And he wakes up with a dream, which is more than a dream, it's a vision. For he sees a ladder right up to heaven. And he sees the angels of God descending and ascending. And he takes the view and he says, surely God, God's in this place and I didn't know it. And like a flash he says, oh God, there's the bargain department coming up. He's got nothing but the clothes he sits down in or stands up in. That's all he's got. He's got no future. He can't go back home. He's a wanted by his brother who knocked the living daylights out of him if he gets him. He's got nowhere to go except some uncle he doesn't know about. And he sits down there and he says, Oh God, if you'll look after me, isn't it good? If you'll feed me and clothe me and take care of me, then Lord, I'll give you 10% of everything I've got. And he hadn't got a shirt button to start with. But I'll give you 10%. What he's saying is, Lord, you provide it all and I'll give you 10% back. And you know, the Lord is so gracious. He says, All right, Jacob, I'll take you up on that. Now, in fairness to Jacob, he kept his word. Of course, he needed to. He was a millionaire before he finished, but he paid up his 10%. And that's where it came. That's how the 10% business started. But that's not the end of giving. That's only the start of it. That's not the senior high graduating in giving. That's just the kindergarten learning how to do it. 10% is where you start, not where you finish. You probably finish up giving 90% living on 10. You do so well. But that's what Jacob did. The God of Jacob. And if you see the way God looked after that old fellow Jacob. And you know the Bible says that Jacob worshipped leaning upon his staff. That's the only time he did really worship. He was an old man. And God had an awful lot of trouble with him right through. But he never left him. And he'll never leave you. And he'll never leave me. Now the last section coming up. He speaks of himself. He's got past the temple, he's got past the people, he's got past the impersonal, now he's very personal. Oh God, he says, look upon the face of thine anointed. And the anointed was David. He was the anointed king, he'd been anointed by Samuel. Oh God, what he's saying is, look upon me. Do look upon me. And here he is, the king, in isolation. And this is what he says, a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. Do you feel that way? Before you start shouting the odds, do you feel that way? I'd sooner have one day with God than three years anywhere else. Big thing to say, isn't it? I'd sooner have, a, I know some Christians would sooner do anything than have a day with God. Because he'd give them such a going over. But a day with God is better than a thousand anywhere else. I live more in one day with God than I'd live a thousand without him. If you know the Lord, you know it's true. You know all the days you lived before you knew the Lord are just wasted. You feel they were anyway. You feel they were just wasted years till you knew him. And one day with the Lord is better than a thousand anywhere else. Have you ever had a good day with God? A really good day? One of those days when he's been so near and so close. And he's walked with you and talked with you. And you've come to the end of the day and you've watched the sun setting in the west. And you've almost felt like saying, stand still, stand still. I never want this day to end. And if ever there's been an end, you've said it's the end of a perfect day. A day with God. A day you'll never forget. And that's better than a thousand days you've spent since. It might have been the day when you were converted. And you said, that's the happiest day of my life. 
might be the day when God blessed you to lead your first soul to Christ. And you said, what a day, what a day. That's the best day. You know, the day you spend with God is better than a thousand days without him. The day you live for God is the day, any day you live for God. You get more out of living for him than you do living without him. And one day spent for God is worth a thousand not spent for God. Because the only days that count are the days you spend for God and with God. And that's all David saying, one day with thee, Lord, is better than a thousand with anybody else. Hope you feel that way. That's the way it should be. Now he's got a job. I'd rather be a doorkeeper. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. That's pretty good, isn't it? Would you? I'd sooner be a doorkeeper. I remember, you know, our expression in Britain for a custodian or a janitor, we're nothing like that. We just call them caretakers. Do you ever use that expression? He's the caretaker. So I remember going into church to preach and one poor fellow got really embarrassed because the place was crowded and so crowded that I couldn't even get to the pulpit and I'd never been in the church before. So I was standing there looking lost, you know, which I'm very capable of doing. And I looked lost and felt lost. And evidently somebody else that was lost came to me. He said, excuse me, are you the caretaker? So I said, well, I hope I am. I said, you know, when I come to think of it, the caretaker, that's a great expression, isn't it? Taking care. I hope I am a caretaker. So just this time somebody else came along and recognized me. This poor fellow was so embarrassed. He said, fancy me thinking you were the caretaker and you were the preacher. I said, what's the difference? I said, one's at one end of the room and one's the other. One's letting them in and the other's belting them when they get in here. So what's the difference? I said, listen, I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to be on lights on Hollywood Boulevard any day. Sooner be a doorkeeper. One who stands at the door and just lets the other people in. You know, good evening, glad to have you with us. Have a good seat, sit down, that's great. Sooner be a doorkeeper, which was looked upon in those days as the least important of the tasks in the temple. There were many, many grades of service in the temple. To be a doorkeeper was the least important. And what David says, I'd sooner be on that door than living it up, living it up. With all the wealth that you can find in the tents of wickedness. Any time. Is that the way you feel? Would you sooner be a doorkeeper in the house of God or living it up on the boulevard or any, anywhere else of your choosing? Maybe living it up or knocking it back in Las Vegas. Which would be your choice as a Christian? Do you ever get any sneaky feelings about how you'd like to live it up in the world? Like the young fellow that was converted and went to Paris for the first time. And after he'd been there, he says, I wished I'd come here before I was converted. <laughs> he hadn't got very far, had he? Is that the way you feel? I wished I'd come here. You go to Las Vegas, the Caesar's Palace, take one sniff and say, boy, do you think I can stop being a Christian for two days? I don't think you've got much. I've been up to Las Vegas, only passed through it. But listen, I'd rather be, I'd rather be in the Baptist church or any other church in that place than dwelling in the tents of the so-called wicked. It's good to know where your allegiance is. It's good to know what your choice is. Good to know the kind of choice you'd make. And David says, I've no doubt I'd rather be. Then he gives his reason. After all, if you make a statement like that, you've got to substantiate it. So you say, I'd sooner have a day with God than a thousand anywhere else. That sounds fine, but why? Because he says, the Lord God is a southern shield. He's the light of my light, that's the sun. And he's the protection of my life, that's the shield. And God gives me light and God protects me. And I'd sooner have God than anybody else in the whole wide world. And then he gives me two things. He is my light, he's my protection, and he gives me grace and he gives me glory. And I find they come together. You never get them separately. If you get grace, you know, some people say with a martyred look on their face, well, it's tough, but God will give me grace. I'll endure it to the finish. I'll stick it out if it kills me. God will give me grace. Grace, grace, grace to the end. Well, it's better to get it that way than not at all. But you know, there's a happier way still. He gives grace and glory. And he never gives one without the other. And the glory enables you to say hallelujah. When you don't feel like saying it. That's what it enables you to do. 
And there's parts of Britain where in the north of England, I think of County Durham, which Jim Smith knows well, in County Durham where instead of saying glory, which is the authentic Queen's English Oxford Dictionary way of saying glory, in County Durham they say glory. They get more of the O and less of the R. And though it isn't the right way to say it, I think they've got the truth. Because glory means glory. The glow. The glory. And if you get glory in your heart, God gives you grace. And he gives you glory. Grace to put up with it. And glory to shout hallelujah while you're putting up with it. The Lord will give it. It's no use looking at Forest Home. It's no use looking to your wife. She's probably in as much need as you are. It's no use looking to your husband. He probably needs it more than you do. Grace and glory and they both come from God the grace of God to take you through and the glory that gets you through and you notice this statement no good thing will he withhold I read behind this that the bad things he'll withhold when it says no good thing he will hold tells me two things he's capable of holding he's capable of withholding he knows what's good and he knows what's bad it tells me that he'll hold back the bad it tells me that he can give me the good and the only thing that will withhold the good is my not walking in his ways. And my responsibility is not to seek the good things for myself. My responsibility is to walk with God. And if I walk with God, no good thing will he withhold. Isn't that wonderful to know? If it's good for me, I'll get it. If it's bad for me, I won't. Hallelujah! I don't want it if it's bad. If it's good, it's coming my way, provided I keep. I know we've got some pilots here who fly planes, and I fly in a lot of planes, but I don't fly them. I'd like to, but I reckon I'm past it. But uh, I'd like to fly. But I do know this, that uh, coming in on a beam, the most important job is just to follow the instructions. I've been in a plane when we've been talked down and had the headphones on. Most fascinating thing in the world to me, because we couldn't see a thing. As far as I was concerned, I didn't know whether we were flying over Red China or Spain. Hadn't a clue. But the people down on the ground knew where we were. And they would tell us when we got to the they make a three degree turn. Lower your speed. Then we were told to drop to a certain height. Every time we're dropping a hundred feet, lessening the speed. We went round and round till finally we're coming down. It's just a little DH repeat, one of the old little planes they used to know about. Time and Noah's Ark, you know. One of those. And we came in on the DH repeat and we were doing about 80 miles an hour just to land. And I can remember hearing the fellow say, you are now approaching the runway at a height of 50 feet. You know, it was incredible because we couldn't see a thing. And as we came just down, there was a little bit of concrete and just touched down, bumped along and we were in. Talked right the way down. Now, if we tried to see our way, we'd have probably finished up in the Atlantic or something. We didn't know where we were. But we were talked down. Somebody did know where we were. And all they had to do was follow the instructions. And as long as we kept to the instructions, we were right down on the runway, safe home and dry. And I found that's the Christian life. All I've got to do is follow the instructions and he'll bring me home safe and dry. That's why the psalmist finishes up by saying, O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man that trusts in me. And all I'd like to say in closing is this, O Lord of hosts, blessed, blessed, Blessed is the man that trusts.